unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your presence that makes us whole. Somebody raise your voice and speak to Jesus. Your Holy Spirit. We honor you, Holy Spirit. We extol you, Holy Spirit. We celebrate you, Holy Spirit. Somebody worship the Holy Spirit. Thank the Holy Spirit. Come on, speak to the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we bless you for who you are. We bless you for your presence. We bless you for your presence.
Jesus. That, that is for your mayor. Clap like you're in 2017. Thank you, Lord. Give 
somebody high five and tell them happy new year 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 then you might be seated thank you lord thank you lord jesus this year many of you if you started with us on the 31st into the first the message was very clear that this year we are answers to prayer somebody say amen These few weeks are just a preparation period of what is going to outpour on our lives. Hallelujah. Your life, your ministry, your family, your marriage life, your education life, Fanera as a ministry, we are just in preparation stage. Hallelujah. I feel great things are happening. I've been hearing things pouring out lately. We have to create space for overflow very soon. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, this is my year to answer. Tell your neighbor, this is my year to answer. So, many of the things I'm going to share this period are going to be in that direction. Why? Because we are preparing saints for the work of ministry to the edification of the body. Somebody say amen. Somebody say amen. Amen. Say amen. Amen. Tonight I have something wonderful to share. Bear with me. It is beautiful. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1. Are we there? It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Somebody say amen. Amen. His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And then said I, that is Isaiah, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Somebody say amen. Isaiah sees the Lord in the king Uzziah died. I remember one time saying, he didn't see the Lord because Uzziah died. The word Uzziah in the year King Uzziah died was just a point of reference in the time he saw God. I hope I'm clear on that. So some people are saying, you have, Uzziah has to die for you to see God. <laughs> Uzziah doesn't need to die to, for me to see God. Hallelujah. Whether he's alive or not, I'm going to see God. Somebody say amen. Now he sees seraphims, he sees the power, he sees glory. And he sees the seraphims with the six wings. And he says, one covered his face, with twain covered his feet, and another did fly. And then at the end of the day, he cried out, they were crying, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, of whom the earth is, the earth is full of his glory. And this is all an experience that Isaiah is having. At the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And the Bible says, and then, the moment the prince of God comes to Isaiah, he says, Whoa! It's me. Why? He says, for a man done, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Now, when the presence of God came in, the first thing that Isaiah was conscious of was his sinful nature. Are we together? The moment the presence of God appeared to Isaiah, bam, he became conscious. Oh my God, I'm a sinful man. Remember the scriptures tell us that no man can see God and live. So his ultimate shock is, I am alive. I am seeing the Lord of hosts. And I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell among people with unclean lips. How come I'm alive? Are we together? And like I said, there are many people, the moment they get in the presence of God, they are conscious of sin. Right? They are conscious of their nature. And that's alright if you are, have not understood God well. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why if you understand the ministry of Isaiah, in the, uh, um, generally speaking, you realize he was addressing a people which knew not their God. That is why in Isaiah chapter 1 he speaks of how oxen, know their masters and asses know their cribs, but the children of Israel consider not. In other words, they did not know the God that they were dealing with. 
And because they don't have knowledge, they are destroyed. The Bible says, for my people die because they lack knowledge. People don't die because they don't fast. I always tell people, people don't die because they don't pray. You don't even die because you have a generational curse. You don't even die because somebody sent poison in your body. No, we die because we lack knowledge. Do Isaiah chapter 1 verses 3. I want to begin from there. Isaiah chapter 1 verses 3. Let me begin from there. He says, the ox knoweth his, knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's script, but the Israel does not know, for my people does not consider. And the next verse says, and he says, a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, they are gone away, backward, that's backslidedness, right? Verse 6, why should ye, now, this is something very important, he says, why should ye be stricken anymore? For ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. Give me the Amplified of that. Amplified of that. Verse 5. He says, why should you be stricken and punished anymore? Since it brings no correction. He says, you will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. Feeble, sick and nauseated. Now I want to show you something funny here. Many people don't understand. Some people think eh, that the judgment of God is what? Brings people to essay. Okay, now let me obey the rules. Eh? The reason why I have to be a good Christian is because I fear the fire. Right? Why? Because we are raised in a place where they used to scare us into salvation, scare us into going to service, scare us into giving, scare you into coming out of... Everything was... They scare you. If you don't serve God, you are going to die. Then you say, okay, let me serve God. You understand? Why? Because you fear what? To die. And this is the thing I've always told saints. That it doesn't matter what or how you deal with human beings. It is a principle simply that you're not going to change men by judgment, by anger and wrath. The children of Israel rebelled and rebelled and after rebelling God punished them. Then they rebelled, then he punished them, then they rebelled and then he punished them more than they rebelled. Then he became more angry and said, okay, maybe let me use fire. Burnt them. They rebelled. Then he says, okay, let me put them in floods. They rebelled. Got them out of floods. Put them. They rebelled. Sent this, they rebelled. Strangers took their lands. They rebelled. They took their daughters. They rebelled. Princes, I mean, of other nations ruled over them and children alike. They rebelled. Until God said, okay, even if I beat you, you won't change. Do you understand what I'm saying? But the knowledge that we were given was if you want to change people, you have to beat them up. You have to smite them. You have to punish them. Right? Parents. <laughs> you think you can change your child because you beat them a lot? Beat. How many of you went to serious high schools? I'm not talking about business projects. I'm talking about serious high schools where they used to beat. Thank you. You dodge morning preps. You know when you dodge morning preps, they are going to only whoop you three. You say three, sleep, three, sleep, sleep. Who remembers? Eh? The government should thank me. But, but you understand what I'm saying? Where you even prepare yourself for punishment and you're sure, okay, even if they beat me. I remember it. <laughs> I know a parent, friend of mine, I was in the presence with, with her and her daughter. This girl was doing funny things in the living room. I think she was trying to pluck a few things out of chairs. Four years old. She told her, I'll beat you. The kid said, whether you beat me or you don't beat me, all are the same. I said, four. Whether you beat me or you don't beat me, all of them are the same. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. People are destroyed because they lack knowledge. And we don't want to pay the price to know. We don't want to buy truths. Hallelujah. 
We seek gift and reward in the presence of God, not truth. That's why I told people this year we are going to seek God through his word than ever before. Why? Because the answer is there. The answer is always there. Watch people who struggle with many things and check how much word is in them. Because it's the truth you know that sets you free. What you don't know that it sets you free. Go to the days where people used to put Bibles under their pillows and they say, now put the Bible. The devil might come at night. Then they get Bibles, eh? right? And then they put them under their pillow. I sleep with my Bible. <laughs> then they put their head there. Right? To be protected under the what? The mighty arm of the Bible. <laughs> Hallelujah. Tell anybody it's the truth you know that sets you free. Tell them again, it's the truth you know that sets you free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isaiah 5.13. He says, Therefore, my people uh, have gone out into captivity. Right? Because they have a generational curse. My people are gone into captivity because they were born in a third world country. My people are gone into captivity because they went to a, bad, a funny school. My people are going into captivity because certain people were supposed to help them refused to help them. My people are going into captivity because they were colonized by the British. My people, you know, and, and by the way, let me say this before I go into that. Chris, there is a demon spirit in the church today called the spirit of entitlement. I don't know whether I'm talking, I'm talking sense here. Do you know there are some people who feel they are entitled? They, they just feel they are entitled. Do they feel... Listen, you, you pay us, pay us. You give, you, that mentality is wrong. Because you get your faith from God and put it on man. The man said, my expectation comes from God. I'm working this way. I have to be paid this way. I am doing this. I have to be dealt with this way. I have, I'm this man of God. They have to carry my bow. I have to, they have to treat me this way because I'm like this. Because I'm this kind of person, they have to address me this way. But, no, ha, ha, ha. Let me tell you, when you create your own honor, you lose it. It's only a matter of time. But when God honors you, I deserve this. I deserve that. I, no, listen. You deserve God. And He's all you need. He's all you need. Stop thinking that you're entitled to man. Or that man is, man, any man owes you. No man owes you. Nobody owes you. Stop acting like somebody owes you. Government, we would try to cause a nayabo. I was reading a taxi. Trying to cause a nayabo. We would have worked, but those ones. I would have been far, but my immediate boss frustrated me. I would have been a success, but my cousin's sister, she always came and stood in my way. I would have increased, but this happened because my cousin did this. I would have been this, but my father is the one who did it to me. I think I'm poor because I was born in Uganda. If I was born in America, ah, yeah, 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 I would be far. I would have been a good wife, but my husband is too quarrelsome. No! He says, for all things that should be known of him, have been made manifest in them that men are without excuse. If he's quarrelsome, fix him in prayer. Hallelujah. If the government is poor, lend it. Oh, he said you shall lend to nation. Tell your neighbor, stop complaining. Sense of entitlement. They feel they need to be paid. They need to be dealt with a certain way. I deserve this. I have to be dealt with this way. No, listen. When you know God, your expectation goes to Him only. When you understand God, even if they don't pay you, He can pay you. Hallelujah. Don't ever make a man responsible for your success. Oh, because you have not paid my man, I'm stuck. No! There is another way God can... Oh, oh! If you trust in the arm of flesh, you will surely fail. Let's go back to our reading. He says, therefore, my people are going into captivity. And he says, because they have no knowledge. And he says, and their honorable men are what? Famished. And their multitudes are... Dried up with what? 
with dust. And the next verse, therefore, hell has what? Enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory and their multitude, right? And their pomp. And he, sorry, and he that rejoices, the Bible says, shall descend into it. Literally, men go to hell because they don't know. Can you believe it? Now, if the Bible has told you you're in captivity because you don't know, invest in knowledge. Simply invest in knowledge. Simply invest in knowledge. Because the Bible has told you his people are in captivity because they lack knowledge. Get knowledge. You'll get out of that issue. Just get knowledge. He says the servant of God must not what? Strive. But what must he do? He must be up to tea. He must be instructing. He, he must take time to, to instruct them. He says he must be gentle to all men, up to teach patience. Next verse. And in meekness, instructing those who do what? That oppose themselves. The word they're opposing is setting yourself against what God knows for, about you. You see, God knows you to be rich, then you start saying, I'm poor. God knows to, you to be wonderful, fearfully and wonderfully made. You always look at yourself and say, look at the nose, look at the nose, look at the nose. You understand what I'm saying? He says, we instruct those that oppose themselves. We don't pray for them. Listen, somebody is poor because they have a poor mentality. There is no prayer that can make you rich. There is only instruction. Paul says, I know how to be full and how to abest. For I'm both instructed to be full and to be abest. For that man, I can only instruct. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. amen. He says, they oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Epignosis, right? That they might recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. He just wakes up and he says, now I'm going to frustrate her. And he frustrates you. Some of you, the devil can annoy you any day. He can use anything. Even a fly. Three times. You don't need too much. But you have to get to a point where a fly can come. Then you're like, ah, the joy of the Lord is my strength. <laughs> ah. When I understood that one time, this is a true story. One time a mosquito came. You know those times when a mosquito is eating? One time a mosquito. So a couple of years ago, came and beat me, bah! and then I, oh! then somehow, somehow, okay, this thing, eh? I told you, when you're done, you'll go. <laughs> Don't try this at home. <laughs> I told the mosquito, when you're done, you're what? you go. Why? Because I don't think it can give me what? Malaria. I'm helping it survive. Now, some scientists are looking at me with this eye of apostle. <laughs> what is this guy up to? That's why we don't get malaria. Because we are not conscious of malaria. Who understands what I'm saying? That's why I'm worried when I see those hands up. Because the world is in trouble. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Recover yourself. This year... Deliver yourself. Don't wait for the man of God to lay a hand on you. No. Get into the same rabba hoya. Your word says, deliver yourself. Stop waiting for the man of God to first call you out and say, now you, God is going to... No. The word is there. The word is there. I say the word is there. Do you remember when Moses was dealing with the children of God? They say, ah, Moses, we are jealous for you. God speaks to you for you. For you, as he doesn't. He says, oh. He says, I wish all that all God's people would what? Prophesy. How? And the next verse says, as the Spirit of God shall rest upon them. Meaning, when you receive the Holy Spirit. You remember how, how the prophet says, for in the last days, 
right? I shall pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Old men shall dream. Dreams, young men shall what? It means you learn to speak into your future. Why? Because you have the Holy Spirit. Hey! If God sends a prophet and they say something wonderful, I receive it. They are confirming. But even before he comes, <laughs> I can't wait for Apostle Grace to fix my future. What if he's not interested? Do you understand what I'm saying? You, you, you speak into your life. You go into the mirror. You tell yourself you're going to be a success. Woman, you're getting that job. You must get married. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Is yes, there? Envious thou for my sake, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Very simple. The moment you receive the Holy Ghost, you just speak into your future. Hey, that me, me eh? that's why I'm, I don't know, I'm worried. You understand? Because many people are going to have questions in future. How did they? How? How did they? Why? Because they, they, can't, they won't be able to explain us. I, I, you know, you have to prepare yourself not to be explained. Now they just see a bunch of excited people. But we are not just excited. When we say HIV leaves the body, it does. When we say cancer leaves... Listen, can God get cancer out of the body and leave you poor? You guys, do you understand what I'm saying? You have to learn to speak so crazy until you scare yourself. Don't say something until you say, eh, go talk it up. Oh! Hallelujah. 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 Now, let's go to Isaiah. I need to show you something very interesting. Isaiah meets God, and the first thing that comes to his head is, Ah, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among unclean people. That was his knowledge. Why? Because when you read through from the beginning of Isaiah chapter 1 all through to the 6th chapter, God is speaking through Isaiah and judging and telling the children of Israel what they are going to be because they have disobeyed him. Judah and Jerusalem. And he says, ah, I think we're all in that whole thing. He goes to God, and the moment he appears before God, the first consciousness, woe unto me. For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. What does the next verse say? The next verse says, Then flew one of the seraphims unto Isaiah, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And the next one says, and he laid it upon the man's mouth and says, Pooh! This has what? Touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away. Thy sin is purged. Now, think with me for a moment. The man is a sinner. He's conscious of sin. Right? An angel comes with calls of, a call of fire. Off an altar. Throws it on the man's lips. And he tells him, you're clean. What next? Now, what did, okay, what did God have to do to cleanse a sinner in that story? You see, some people misunderstand sin, how God takes away sin. You see, some of you, it's because of how you think. He said, I'm unclean. I have unclean lips. I dwell among people with unclean lips. Yes. And then God comes to the man, gets a coal of fire, throws it on his mouth, and he tells him, you're clean. What next? The moment Isaiah is conscious that he has been cleansed, the next verse 8, he says, listen, go to the next verse. He says, and also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? <laughs> I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Which goes before? The cleansing or the sending? Answer me. The cleansing or the sending? The moment the Lord cleanses him, he asks, who shall go for us? Isaiah didn't even ask which mission. Then he says, they say, send me, send me. Why? I'm clean. I'm conscious that sin separates people. The Bible says it disturbs relations. 
It's the only thing that can hold me from prayer. So from, from access. Sin is the only thing that can make me conscious that God will not hear my prayer. Now that you've purged my mouth and told me I'm clean, I don't care where you're sending me. I'll be a success. The moment, you see, all through, the call is there. But the commission is not there. Right? The moment the sanctification comes, the cleansing comes, the commission goes. Do you understand? When he called you, when he when he predestinated you, or pre, when he planned you before, the Bible is very, is very clear, right? He, he knew your calling had to move with a justification. You cannot have a justification without a calling. And you cannot have a calling without a justification. You're justified because you are called. And you're called because you're justified. The reason why you're saying, I am called of God to serve him, is because he has approved you right and fit to serve him. Many are just conscious every time they go in the presence of God. I'm unworthy. God, I want to serve you. But, but I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy. They are always conscious of how unworthy they are for God to use them. Brother, it's too late. <laughs> By the time you, you know that you are called of God, you are already justified. And what did it take for Isaiah? Isaiah did not need, God didn't, and, and many of you should understand, eh? this was a spiritual event. It wasn't physical. Isaiah was in the spirit when all of this was happening. Now, put yourself in Isaiah's shoes. Next day you tell people, the Lord cleansed me of all sin last night. How? I was in the spirit. And then an angel threw a call on my lips and told me you are clean. Everybody says up. We know the ordinances very clearly. Right? They are in diverse washings, isn't it? And sacrifices of animals, rams, heifers, HTC. That's the order we know. You're waking up in the morning and taking, telling us you are in the spirit and God just threw a call on your mouth and he made you clean. Isaiah, are you sober? Cult. You know, people in the world, everything they don't understand is what? Is cult. Hallelujah. He comes and tells you that I have cleansed you through my word. Why do you think you need more? Why do you think you need more? He says, with my word, I have cleansed you. When he says, I have cleansed them with, with the washing of the water, which is my word. It is as clear, yes, that is, I might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. If he says it's the word that cleanses you, the only way you can be clean is the word. Ah, uh ah, -uh, you have to go and, you, you, some of you, you're, you're Muslims in spirit. You do evolution, right? I went in a Muslim school. Women used to have abolition, right? You don't touch them. They become unclean if you're a man. Is it? You remember those days. Eh? Wuzu, right? They are full of wuzu. You touch a. Ah! Ah! <laughs> those washings are not new. In the scriptures, they were there. Men have washed. <laughs> and they'll continue to wash. And he says, woe unto you. For you look at the cup outside. The washing of the cup outside. But not inside. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me tell you. The cleansing the new creature has is through the word. Accept it. That God through his word is cleansing you. Even as I'm sharing right now. The, the angels are washing you. 
by the time you're coming out of this meeting, you're spotless clean. Why? Because Isaiah was conscious of what? Of sin. First John chapter 3, verses 19. It sounds strong there. He says, and hereby we know that we are of the truth. Somebody say we are of the truth. This is how we know that we are of what? Of the truth. He says, hereby we know that we are of the truth. And shall assure our hearts before him. Meaning that when you are before him, you assure your heart. Now, do you know why the Bible says we assure our hearts? It is because the true challenge that we go through as spiritual warfare is every time we stand in the presence of God, the devil tries to disqualify us. You're not worthy. You don't deserve to be here. God will not hear you. You did this last week. You don't deserve this. I'm sure, God, I won't do this. You could, how could you do this? And you're the one now praying. You did this last week. And you're the one now speaking. How could you do this? You're not worthy. You understand? Because that's what the devil does always. Many people can't even approach the, 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 the prince of God. Why? Because they are too conscious of what they have done. Every time they go there, they go like Isaiah. Oh, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell among people with one unclean lips. So, let's go back to John. He tells you that hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Next verse says, for if our heart condemn us, the Bible says, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. I'm a man of unclean lips. Yes, I know you're a man of unclean lips, but I am your God and I'm greater than the condemnation of your heart. Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Just believe that I cleanse you by the word. Just believe that I impute righteousness on you. Believe that you receive righteousness through faith. Believe it! Okay, your heart is condemning you. Yes, I'm bigger than it. I am telling you. Next verse. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we? What do we have? Confidence toward what? That means when you're in the presence of God, you have what? Confidence. And the Bible says that we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence till the end. The moment that confidence stays in your spirit, you'll always see God. You'll always see God. You'll always see God. Hallelujah. But you have to hold on to that confidence. Behold, the reason why our hearts don't condemn us is not because we've grown callous. It's not because we've become indifferent and our conscious, consciences have been seared. No. It is because the Lord of our hearts has gone above the condemnation and qualified us. I don't know that you understand what I'm saying. Somebody say, I'm qualified by God. Say it again, I'm qualified by God. He says, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. And he says, beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then have we confidence toward God. And here is the problem now. And whatsoever we ask, we receive whatsoever. Now that's the problem. Whatsoever. Yes. Whatsoever. We ask. He says we receive. Why? Because you don't go in his presence condemned. Does that mean that you go in his presence perfect? You're not perfect. You just don't go condemned. Now ye apostle, what are you saying? There is therefore, there in the presence, therefore, no condemnation. For them which are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the life-giving spirit has set them free from the law of sin and death. It doesn't mean that God doesn't know your weakness. It means he knows your weak and he's working on it. <laughs> Hebrews 4 says, For brethren, we have not a high priest who has not been touched by our infirmities. He says, For though he was tempted in all things, though he didn't what? He was without sin. And what does the next verse tell us? The next verse tells us, he says, Let us therefore come fearful. No, he says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help 
in time of need, come bold. Not because you're strong, but because you have a high priest who was tempted in all ways and he was without sin. And when you're going there, you don't go in your own accord. You don't go on your own strength. You don't go in your own glory. You go through him. That's why we have strength and confidence. And you realize that every time he's dealing with the presence of God, he's always taking us to the throne of grace. When Moses came to tell him, I need to hear your voice like never before, he told him, don't go to the judgment seat, Moses. Go to the mercy seat just above the cherubims. There I will meet you. I don't talk where there is no mercy. I don't deal with you face to face where there is no mercy. You cannot see my grace. You cannot see my glory if you won't accept my mercy. He's speaking at the mercy seat. He's inviting you to the throne of grace. Not judgment. But some of you every time you go to the throne of grace like you're going to a throne of judgment. There is no condemnation. Your past judgment and to life. Woo! Is that what the scripture says? He says, for brethren, we have past judgment and to life. That's what the Bible says. We've past judgment and to life. Uh-huh. Aha. Yes, that's how the news is. It's too good to be true. But it's still the good news. Somebody say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. It's still the good news. You know why you don't receive answers? It's because you check yourself when you're going to pray. Father. God, what did I do last week? Ay, 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 ay. Ah, let me come back. Then you leave his presence. Then you go and then you what? You get abolition. Then you come to him. Then they touch you when you're entering. Pa! Then you go back. Ah! Then you go again and do what? Receive abolition. Because you're too conscious of your position before him than his position before you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go back to our art. Let's go back to our art. He says, and do, he says, because we keep, now I'm coming there. <laughs> because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And he says, uh-huh, because we do the commandments. Next verse. And he says, and this is his commandment. <laughs> this is his commandment. He says, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. He says, this is the covenant hey, that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. He says, I'll put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. And he says, next verse, and their sins and iniquities, he says, I will what? I will remember no more. And the next verse says, now where remission of this, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, fear, no, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil. That is his what? His flesh, right? So, Figuratively, when the Bible says that when they were in the presence of God, that time in, 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 in the crucifixion, his death, right? The Bible says that the veil was rent in two. While they were beating Christ, right? It was a figurative representation of God tearing the veil that separated the holy place and the holy of holies. That is why when Paul saw what they were doing to Jesus, he said, if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Because crucifying him, every nail that went through, every stripe that was going on his back, the veil was opening. Access, access, access. If the devil knew that he was opening the veil, he would not have smitten the Lord of glory. 
He would not have beaten the Lord. He would not have beaten the Lord. If the devil knew that Jesus represented that veil, he would not have crucified Jesus. Why? Because he wanted to keep that veil as long as can held back. Says that the place, the presence of God is just the story men talk about and a few men access. The high priest, the Bible says, went in every year to offer sacrifices. It was a place some people would have to say, I was in the presence. Wow, I admire you. Can you take me there? Oh, sorry, I'm not the high priest, right? There was just one guy in every generation to go there on behalf of it. Now everyone can go. He says, come as you are. Don't first put yourself in order. No. That way into the Holy of Holies is not your hard work. No. It is his consecration. He consecrated it for you. He did it for you. It's not you who makes yourself right before God. It is Jesus. That's how you know he will hear your prayer. Why? Because you're not going there on your own terms. You're going there on his terms. Somebody say amen. Amen. Somebody say amen. Amen. This is too hard for some people to understand. That is why you pray and pray and pray and pray. And then you don't see answers. Why? Because you're still conscious of your goodness. Today God is going to hear me more. Why? Because I fasted for 20 days. Tomorrow God is going to respond to me more. Why? Because I, I did this. No. God does not respond to you because you do. He responds to you because you believe on him who does. Somebody say amen. Amen. Somebody say amen. Amen. It's that new and living way. It's that new and living way. It's not dead. It's always there for any child of God who says, I want to access God. But I I can't go to God. I'm unworthy. Do you know how many people are not coming to church? Because the first church they attended told them how bad they were. I can't come in church. If I come, I, 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 I don't know, God can even kill me. The things I've done, Apostle, first wait. Let me first put my house in order. No, come as you are. He, 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 he cut a wire for the children of Israel. He told them, I want nothing to do with you. I don't even want to talk to you. The next thing you know, he's like that guy who just loves you so much, even if you annoy him. He says, okay, okay, come now, let's reason together. For even though your sins are scarlet, I, I will turn them to us as white as snow. Even if you, they are as red as crimson, I will turn them to all. Come, can you see? The, 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 the guys are running away from him. He's running back to them telling him, I still love you. I'm annoyed, but I'm, sti- I'm still... In-. Because that is him. He loves you unconditionally. That is why boasting his love for you. Not your love for him. You can love him, but it's not enough. It's his love for you. You respond because he loves you. He's mad at the children of Israel. All through, he's telling them, you've done this. I am annoyed with you. I am mad at you. He says, but I'll cleanse her again. I'll make her a chest virgin again. I'll fix her again. You see, that's how he's dealing with them. He's annoyed, but his plan is not, he's saying, I will fix them. I'm annoyed, but I'll fix them anyway. That is the heart of God. That's the man after God's own heart. You remember David? I'm not red stammer. He raped his sister. David said, no. It's bad, but let me be patient with this boy. Why? Because I still believe in him. I still believe in him. Absalom kills him. Then he goes after Absalom. Why? Because you are not supposed to judge who are not judged. That's why the Christ had to come through that seed. He could not come through. The Bible says that his blood speaketh better things. <laughs> because the blood of Abel speaks vengeance. His blood speaks love. He says, that's why you've come. Zion. His blood speaketh better things. He is not seeking vengeance. Every time you are told of his cross, the first thing that comes to your spirit is his love for you. His love for you. His love for you. Let me tell you, God loves you. The church has to go past 
singing it because the Bible tells them so. For the Bible tells me so. He says that you might know the love of God which passes knowledge without experience. I want to take you to a place where I will love you until you, you feel that I love you. That the Bible doesn't need to tell it to you. No. That you, you, you sit there and you say, Oh! Oh! I feel loved. I feel so loved by God. And he says, Despisest thou the what? The long suffering. The patient endurance of God. Knowing not that his goodness leadeth men to repentance. Some people despise his long suffering. They despise his patient endurance. They, 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 they say, ah, why is God? No, says, despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering. Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. You don't know that it is how good he is that will lead you to his repentance. You, you know, he's, you're not going to repent because he's bad and angry. His anger toward you is not going to make you better. His goodness will make you better. Don't despise his goodness. Don't take it for granted. And how do men despise it? By assuming that his goodness leads to more sin. Some people think that the goodness of God causes men to sin more. They don't understand his grace. They despise his goodness. In other words, they're telling him, you can't be that good. You have to be angry a bit so they don't sin. They're changing the order of God to, 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 to provide for their understanding of who God is and establish their own righteousness. And he says that the wrath of man worketh not righteousness. Don't think that because you're too angry that God is not angry at the other person. God should be angry. Why? You're despising his goodness. Knowing not that that is the goodness that leadeth men to repentance. Men are sorry when God loves them. Men become more rebellious when he beats them up. Isaiah said it. What's the point of beating you anymore? Every time I punish you, you become worse. What do I do? Let me just love you. And when he loved them, they came to him. Love draws. Love draws. Even as ministers, pastors, let's teach love. Let's teach love. Because God is love. He says, if you lift me, love, up, I will draw men to myself. That's what he does. Preach the love of God and leave men with God. Don't think that God has sent you to, to repair everyone. Some of you think God has sent you to change people. Me, God sent... No. God did not send you to change people. He sent you to give... To, to preach Him, dead and resurrected. Leave people with their God. Because He knows all things. He knows all things. He knows all things. Why do you think Satan is Satan, the accuser of the brethren? It is because he can't stand that God is still blessing people who deserve not to be blessed. That's why the Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. He's ever living to accuse the brethren. He did this. Ah, he, that's what the devil does. He's always doing that. And some Christians are his advocates. They're in ministry always pointing. He stole. Ah, he did this. Ah, she did this. Ah, ah, I saw her. Ah, she did that. Ah, I'm so happy. She has died. They're going to beat her. Ah. You remember when we were kids? You do something wrong. And your father says, why have you done this? Then your young brother goes and brings the stick in advance. That he has the stick. He has the stick. You might be looking for a stick to beat him and it's not there. He has the stick. Beat him. <laughs> then they beat you. Then I turn out to tell the guy, let daddy go tomorrow. <laughs> then he lives in absolute fear. Then daddy goes, Bwah! the gate closes. You got the gate. You make sure he has gone. Then you come to the guy, uh huh. So why were you snaking me? <laughs> ah, in the morning. You ram him a few punches. Pa, pa, pa. Three of them. Oh, he cries. He keeps quiet. At 10 a.m. 8 p.m. Your daddy comes back. Oh! <laughs> to be continued. 
Omwana wakubye wachi. He beat me. Uh. Even tomorrow. <laughs> That's why some of them are called little devils. <laughs> uh. Praise God. I want to finish. So Isaiah, a man of unclean lips, God purges his mouth and then cleanses him. The next thing we know, his eyes are open to see the call. And the moment God imputed righteousness on Isaiah, he stopped prophesying about Judah and Jerusalem. Only his eyes went on to a certain revelation. 53. He's walking in the spirit. He sees a man. He says, he came from a tender plant. This is Isaiah walking in the spirit. And his roots were from dry ground. He was not a man that was, had any beauty as of to behold upon. He, nor was he comely. He looked oppressed and afflicted. We considered him smitten, stricken and afflicted of God. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we were healed for we were all like sheep that went astray each man their own way. But he took and carried all our sins and iniquities. Even in affliction he saved nothing. Isaiah met Christ and the finished work. Isaiah Only clean lips could say that. Only clean lips could see that. Only clean lips. The lips before chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, they were all on judgment. The moment he met the Christ, he started to see the love of God. Jesus started to reveal himself before Isaiah. He started to realize, okay, I'm in the presence of God right here. God started forwarding him into the future. He started to see the Christ as he is. He walked there and he saw the wounding. He saw the man being beaten. He said, okay, that ugly guy I'm seeing is the Christ. We thought he was afflicted because he was the wrong guy. In other words, in his time, when the Christ was being crucified, they were sure that he was being crucified for the right cause. Yet John sees the same man and tells him, no, they hated him without cause. If they had read Isaiah, they would have known that the man was not wrong. They were wrong. The ones he died for, they, cruci- he, they were crucifying him. Isaiah saw the mystery. 53. He said, my God. He met the Christ. And he saw the finished work. He did not only see it and prophesy its future. He entered it and owned it. And he says, by his stripes, we are healed. He also included himself. He, he put... He got a future experience and put it in a past life for him. He was wounded. He didn't say he would be wounded. He was bruised. He didn't say he would be bruised. No. And the testimonies of our peace was upon him. By those steps, we are healed. He says, no. Now that I've seen this revelation, even if he's not yet come in the flesh, by faith I'm walking there. Because there is no way it can be this beautiful. And I just stay there. I can't miss this time. 2016, I can't miss that time. I have to claim myself there. By the time we enter in 254, he says, single barren woman. Because the children, he, he, the children that you're going to have are more than the woman which was producing children. He tells you, enlarge your tents. <laughs> he says, don't hold back. Next verse, verse 2. He says, enlarge your tents. Bless your tents. Enlarge your tents. Let them stretch forth the curtains of thy inhabitation. He says, spare not, lengthen thy cords. He says, because I've seen Christ, a barren woman must what? Must sing. He tells you, expand your tent. Expand your tent. Because I've seen it. You can't think small. You can't dream small. Expand your tent. 55, verse 1. <laughs> you see how they have a progression. He says, Oh, everyone that thirsteth, 
come to the water. He that has no money, come ye buy. Eat here. Yeah. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. See, he's seeing the man paid the price. Fifty six is talking about the inheritance of the righteous. Then he goes to sixty. Verse sixty. I'll finish with that. He says, Arise! He says, And shine. For thy light is come. And he says, And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Next verse, come on. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee. And his glory shall be seen upon you. I love the next verse. And Gentiles shall come to thy light and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. And they lift up your eyes. He says, round about and see all oh, they that gather themselves together. They come to you. And he says, thy sons shall come from far, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy sight. They will not be nursed by anyone. Then thou shalt see and flow together. There won't be divisions in the church. You will all be flowing in the same spirit. You say we are going street preaching, we are all on the streets. You say we are praying, you are all praying. You say we are giving, you are all giving. You say we are believing. You are all believing. Why? Because you are sowing with your own. And he says, and thine heart shall fear. What is the fear? And be enlarged because of the abundance. He says, the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. And he says that the multitudes of camels shall cover thee. You can put Lamborghinis. The The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. Do you remember the wise men? Gold, frankincense, and mar. The multitudes of camels shall cover you. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. That's on the next verse. Uh -huh. And all from the... Oh, hey, 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 before, before. And all from... Hey, hey, before, verse 6. And all they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of God. Next verse. And all the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nebioth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with the acceptance of mine altar, and I'll glorify the house of my glory. And he says, And who are these that fly as the cloud? They're asking about you. And as the doves to their wings. And he says, surely the isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish first, to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold with them, and to the name of the Lord thy God, and to the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified thee. And the sons of strangers shall build up your oh, they shall build up your walls, and their kings shall minister unto you. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor I have had mercy on thee. Therefore, your gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. And the next verse says, For the nation and kingdom that, the, that will not serve thee shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly wasted. And the glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee. The fir tree, the pine tree, the, the box together to beautify the place of my sanctuary. And I'll make the place of my feet glorious. And he says, The sons also of them that have afflicted thee. Listen. The sons of them who treated you funny, the sons of them who betrayed you, the sons of them who spoke evil about you, they shall come bending unto thee, and they shall, they that despised you, shall bow themselves down at the soles of your feet, 
and they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellence, a joy of many generations. That's a man who saw God. I see the Lord. I see the Lord. So Above the worst hell for the people of the earth, I see the Lord, I see. Raise your voice and speak to Jesus. Take a minute. My eyes have seen the King, the light upon the throne. right now and speak into your future. Thank you. 
the name of Jesus that you rise up and shine for your light is come and Gentiles come to thy light kings come to your rising you're going to change this world you're the answer to Africa you're the answer to Europe you're the answer to Asia you're the answer to your family you're the answer to your institution you're the answer to your home area you're the answer to the church in the name of Jesus I bless your going in I bless your going out I bless your bread and water. I bless your substance. I decree favor upon you. I decree increase upon you. I decree multiplication upon you. I decree sanctification upon your life. You're cleansed by His word. Habits are dying. Weaknesses are dying. Sin is dying. The revelation of His love envelops your soul. It is touching everywhere. And this is love made perfect that you might have confidence on that day. For as he is, so are you in this world. I pray for the sick right now. Touch wherever it's painting. The power of God is moving through your body. He's healing all sickness. He's healing all disease. He's healing all pain. He's healing all affliction. I rebuke every disease. There is somebody here. You have been asking God. Your heart is very sick. You want a new heart. Right now in the name of Jesus. I pray for your heart. You are going to go to a doctor's. A few days from now. They are going to tell you. Your heart is healthy. If you had heart problem. I want you to go to the doctor. Because I feel we have a testimony next Thursday of a heart healed and restored like that of a baby. In the name of Jesus. God is healing your diseases. There's another person. You've been having kidney issues. And your leg has been swelling. is healing her right now. In the name of Jesus. God heals you. God heals you. I rebuke every blood disease. In the name of Jesus. If you have any bones out of line, God is putting them in line right now in the name of Jesus. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest. Thank you.